Good morning, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to welcome you to join us today for this packed session where we will uh, review the two years of the Charter of Trieste, which was devoted to accessibility to services for all persons. Just a very brief introduction, since the first uh, speaker will for sure uh, introduce the concept in depth. The Charter of Trieste on Accessibility to Services for All Persons was launched at ease of 2020, thanks to the initiative of the National Center for Telemedicine, Telemedicine and New Healthcare Technologies of the Italian National Institute of Health, thanks to the autonomous region Friuli Venezia Giulia and Feder Sanità Friuli Venezia Giulia with all of whom we had uh, the pleasure to share our humble contribution to make uh, this charter possible. Back then we left uh, saying uh, that we would meet each other again for ease of 2022 in Leiden and our proposal uh, to contribute a session was accepted by them. Thank you. And we were expecting to have um, a lot of uh, interactions and uh, conversations with the public about this in the two years uh, in between. In reality, we all know the pandemic wave of COVID has uh, changed uh, a lot the focus uh, of conversations in Europe. Nevertheless, uh, we do believe it has offered uh, a unique opportunity to rethink uh, service provision and service design from very new angles and uh, to think how digital uh, technologies uh, can make accessibility a, a reality for more people. So we are very excited to, to host uh, this conversation today. I just want to introduce the first speaker by mentioning uh, this uh, old uh, cartoon and, and, and the wisdom that I think uh, it holds. We, we often think of what we design as based on evidences and objective data. And um, while this is uh, partially true, at least, uh, we often forget the second part of the story, which is that most of these uh, objective data are in reality the result of a rather long chain of uh, decisions taken by humans behind uh, the design of the system. And, and this is very important because when we are reflecting about accessibility, we do need to always contemplate counterfactuals, to be prepared for uh, variability, to be prepared for the unforeseen and uh, to not uh, have to look back uh, and try to label uh, black swans uh, what probably wasn't. Uh, after all, uh, even though, as mentioned, COVID has, uh, has been a huge uh, wave uh, on all of us, uh, we cannot forget uh, that uh, this is X uh, was a priority for WHO since a decade at least. And probably we could have done more in service design uh, to, to be ready for uh, accessibility in such conditions. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker to you without uh, stealing any further time. Uh, Dr. Francesco Gabrielli is a very dear friend of mine, uh, uh, an accomplice of many adventures uh, in the past. He is director of the National Center for Telemedicine and uh, New Health Technologies of the National Health Institute of Italy. And as I told you, he is the mind behind the charter, uh, really. So who better than him to open uh, this session? Francesco, please take the stage. One special greeting from Rome. I'm Francesco Gabrielli, Director of National Center for Telemedicine and New Healthcare Technology. Thanks to my friends, Professor Marco Manca, and to as of 2022 organizations for this occasion to tell you this is a summary on the Charter of Trieste. Our aim with this activity is to promote the real accessibility to the digital services for all persons. The Charter, as the name of Trieste, a well-known historical Italian city in which Azov took place in 2020, as you know. On that occasion, the first partners who supported the presentation of the Charter were the 
where um, the um, national, uh, Italian National Institute of Health and the, the National Center for Telemedicine as a part of it. And those were a representative of, from public institutions, uh, the, um, the Friuli Venezia Giulia region and the most important association of municipalities in Italy dedicated to their care, Fede Sanità Anci. At the same time, we had the fundamental scientific support from Design for All Europe and Shim Pools Foundation. The first focused on uh, architecture issues and smart cities um, issues, and the second on healthcare and life science. The objective of the Charter are to overcome the barriers that hinder access to services and the employment and the enjoyment of people's rights to make the best use of digital technologies in daily life as well as in scientific progress. The Charter calls on policymakers, scientists, professionals, and all local authorities to support the development of nine action and key points. In the next two uh, slides, I summarized these nine key points. The healthcare systems have to manage a change in processes, turning the introduction of digital innovations in an opportunity. All local health systems must be enabled to benefit from the contribution of technologies available for social and health care, investing in personal education and inviting stakeholders participation. Moreover, to remove causes of inequalities and equitable system development through the appropriate use of telemedicine services and digital innovations. The governance of the service innovation should be evaluated on how it delivers on inclusion, mobility, and overall quality of life for the most vulnerable citizens at first. It is necessary to deepen the knowledge of the digital tools and the situational awareness of stakeholders for the correct governance of their introduction and working. The institutional representatives and stakeholders have to make efforts to avoid the risk and the lack of technological skills and economic resources combined with a strong digitalization of services will create additional barriers and exclusion factors. The seventh point is focused on the removal of barriers to access to services requires a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approach. The policies dedicated to the use of digital telecommunication technologies, artificial intelligence, and other digital innovations to improve the mobility and autonomy of citizens and people with disabilities. Professionals in the research and development and the research and innovation are encouraged to make available the most advanced digital solutions in a spirit of equity and partnership with local authorities, public and private health or rehabilitation structures. Since 2020, National Center for Telemedicine is also a member of Digital Health Advisory Group for Europe a communitarian activity coordinated by the Finnish Ministry of Social Affairs and Health. National Center for Telemedicine has brought the question of access to, to, uh, um, to digital technologies to the attention of the group, and the Digital Advisory Group approved and insert the Charter of Trieste in its document on the European Co Cooperation Solutions to promote digital inclusion and increase the resilience of society. Uh, and it happens in September 2021. So thank you for all your attention. Uh, thank you for all your, thank you so much for all your attention. Do not hesitate to call us in, in here in Rome. Bye.
Thank you again, Francesco, for your terrific uh, introduction to the Charter. And uh, I'm sure you will also be excited to hear our next speaker. Uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Isabel Wachsmut. Uh, Isabel uh, is a dear friend and uh, she is a brilliant mind who has been involved uh, for over uh, 25 years now in uh, experimentations around uh, different ways of uh, including um, more variety of the world in, in our conversations and uh, inevitably in uh, reflections around how we design uh, services uh, and systems. Uh, now uh, she is currently involved uh, with uh, huge initiatives uh, like uh, Health Information for All uh, in, in the French uh, Africa and uh, a number of projects uh, uh, around uh, how to use art uh, to make sense uh, of care and to improve accessibility to care, which I am uh, super excited to hear about uh, probably today. So Isabel, I leave the stage to you and thank you for being here. Good morning, uh, everybody. I am very happy um, today to, to be able to present to you a very important topic. The first topic is about the community of purpose has been set up in the World Health Organization. It's called Linguistic Collaboration Health Information for All. And it is very important uh, community uh, and uh, this presentation, it is really to answer to the first question that has been uh, requested to me. This question was about the role of Health Information for All as a um, new technology platform, specifically to bring uh, collective intelligence and as well to bring more cooperation, collaboration, and even co-creation of knowledge between different disciplines, between different um, language, different culture uh, over the world, and specifically to help to give access to everyone to the best information, to the best knowledge they need to uh, take uh, some decision about their, um, their health and to maintain their health. And uh, from this uh, topic, I will give you some um, key elements, key challenge we have faced, but as well key lesson learned from this experience. I am Isabel Vaxmuth from the World Health Organization and part of the important division in WHO in charge of universal health coverage and health systems. And I will start with some key facts uh, about this um, type of community of purpose. Why we have set up uh, this initiative? Because we have um, see our language barrier have a major impact on the both quality and the cost of healthcare. Uh, it is as well related to the inequality in healthcare and poor health outcomes, the insufficient training for both healthcare professionals and medical interpreters. We have seen as well most of the curricula on clinical communication skills don't allow much space for a language gap, including patient-provider communication. And while what is very important to consider as well, it is more in disciplinary research, uh, specifically to advance knowledge about you know, the promotion of uh, specifically linguistic diversities. Why it is important to consider, in fact, uh, this linguistic um, cooperation, collaboration? You can see on this figure, on the slide, you know, how the repartition of the language over the world, and I will not go in details because you can see it. But what we can keep in the mind, it is English is the lead of the world language in what concerns communication and publication. That is very important. And the other key um, element, it is spoken, this English um, language, it is spoken by 508 
million people, but it is less than 8% of the world population. And uh, in this figure, that don't include, in fact, all native language at worldwide level. So that is another issue, how we can specifically, in terms of healthcare information, how we can reach as well everyone. Uh, it's really about the question of inclusiveness, you know, because many of people, you know, they have their own native language. And if uh, we have not support to translate, you know, key health information um, in, in this language, uh, it will be a deficit for these people and they will not be able, in fact, to, to, to reach um, you know, the, the level of health they, they, they can, in fact. And uh, those aspects, it's more than 92% of people on Earth don't understand English. And that is a very important element. And therefore, whatever is produced or published in this language has no value for these people. Donc, it is important to consider linguistic collaboration, specifically in healthcare, but as well in the other sector, because why? Language is the main instrument used to establish, you know, meaningful relationship, convey ideas, and communicate message among each other. And it's a question of of the quality of communication, the quality of relationship, and at worldwide level. It is about the quality of interaction between people through language, and it is as well a way to federate this collective intelligence mechanism. Increasingly, information and knowledge are key determinants of wealth creation, social transformation, and human development. And we have seen that very clearly with COVID uh, pandemic, because uh, the, the, the majority of people have been in such isolation, loneliness, uh, and this lack of, um, of interaction between each other and these interpersonal skills, you know. Uh, and we have seen the damage, you know, on the, directly on the health of these people. So we need to reconsider the importance of this communication and this uh, extremely uh, fluent level of uh, interaction with each other. And uh, another aspect, it is mother tongue is still the first choice to interact with the world. And um, it's very important because, uh, as well, some studies have uh, demonstrated, you know, um, how uh, our perception uh, in many cases is not uh, very accurate in this case because we need to consider specifically, you know, how this knowledge will be applicable, in fact, in the uh, local settings, in the context. So it's even more complex than we can imagine because you can produce very valuable, uh, including very understandable, under, understandable uh, knowledge. But if uh, it is uh, not very well uh, translate in terms of the, the, the meaning, in terms of the, the level of understanding by um, the target population, for example, uh, you will have no, um, no impact. So that is really a key issue. And for that, what we do uh, with this initiative? Uh, we consider lang language need to be part of mainstream healthcare services since they may generate considerable long-term cost if left unaddressed. Language need to be considered in the communication of health research as well. For example, it's very important to establish um, some effective bridge between, for example, policymaker researcher and as well people in charge to implement policies, specifically the civil society organization, but uh, uh, it's important as well to consider a bridge between different disciplines and different sectors together to have better holistic understanding of any societal challenge or issue. It is about to promote linguistic cultural diversity and mutual understanding is not only crucial to individual empowerment, but 
also to economic sustainability and social cohesion. And as we know today, we need tremendously this sustainability and social cohesion to find again a, a balance in this world to be sure people will be more healthy and be able to maintain this health. What are the ingredients of this community of purpose? It's first about to share common public good, to align the different mindsets, specifically based on universal value, and we will come back to that, how you reach, including if you have different language, different culture, universal language. We need to work trans in transdisciplinary way and to identify and connect power users. These users are able really to inspire each other and to initiate a valuable, uh, in fact, dialogue and discussion, you know, uh, among the other members. And for that, we have uh, seen uh, health information for all forums, uh, leading different uh, speaking language, French, English, Portuguese, and Spanish today. Uh, they are a good start, in fact, to initiate this uh, movement, this process. Here you can see what I have mentioned to you. Donc it is really how we consider all these different speakers, but as well to include systematically the media, the publisher and librarian, the people, the frontline health workers, the primary health care as well, health professionals, health practitioners, and the civil society, I have mentioned that, researchers and policy makers. But of course, that is just one part of the stakeholders. And how IFA contributes? It contributes to effective networking. You know, it's about networking and collaboration between members. It's about effective sharing, trigger exchange, and sharing of views among the members. It is about knowledge access. It's to push relevant evidence on health priority topics with publication or resume irrespective language. And for us, it is critical to simultaneous, in simultaneous way to mobilize, understand, and communicate. You know, and it's a way uh, we can increase you know, uh, the rapid access to knowledge, explicit and tacit knowledge in the same time, and to amplify this cooperation. We can as well better assess the needs and the gap immediately and specifically trigger the appetite to uh, discuss about, uh, you know, idea, but as well to stimulate critical thinking and reflection. It is a sustainable solution as well because that increases equitable, equitable visibility of initiative, all the initiative over the world, and as well the different aspect of knowledge. And today, uh, with this Global Health Discussion Forum, it is uh, more than uh, 20,000 members today, because that have increased. And uh, it's really a beautiful way, step by step, to build uh, this type of community. For us, the vision of this Health Information for All, it is a world where every person has access to healthcare information they need to protect their health and the health, the health of other. You have seen the, the approach, it is multilingual community of purpose, and we have as well what we call working groups. These working groups can be set up in function of priority, specifically, for example, by year. Like we have some working group on access to health research, evidence from policy and practice, and for example, the issue of multilinguism I have mentioned. And, uh, for example, one objective of this group of multilinguism it is to promote sharing of experience on how to improve the availability and the use of healthcare information in language other than English. This provides a space for global health communication in language as well as other, other than English. You know, it's very important.
Thank you, Isabel. It's always super interesting to listen to you and, and all the things you are doing and thinking about. Uh, now, uh, because our time is somewhat limited, but as I mentioned, uh, introducing you, I'm super curious. I would like to ask you to spend a few words about uh, your uh, work around uh, art uh, and uh, and, and care, art and the systems of care. Uh, and I know you, you are keen to apply. So I, I leave the words again to you and thank you. I would like to complement, in fact, what I have uh, present to you about um, this uh, community of purpose, you know, uh, health information for all. And uh, I, I would like to complement with, for example, the, the fact in terms of the information alone is uh, many times not enough to uh, engage and to communicate specifically with the uh, general public and with a much broad um, you know, audience. And uh, for that, uh, I had the opportunity uh, for uh, some years to explore, uh, and thanks to our director general uh, from WHO, because he has uh, uh, allowed this opportunity to, to be tested, to, to know, for example, what, how we can communicate additionally to uh, just, you know, um, information by writing or, uh, you know, um, report or guideline and how we translate, in fact, this, uh, this type of knowledge, this type of information under a more accessible format, more inspirational format, specifically for general public. And specifically, uh, what it is the opportunity for this public to understand better uh, what does it mean for themselves, you know, and as well how they can really uh, make a difference uh, for their life and as well for their well-being. And for that, I will tell you more about what we have incubated. Uh, it is a project called Art Impact for Health, and we were able to extend this incubator to, the, um, to, to address as well sustainable development goals. It is really about to, to, to mention to you uh, how art can make a difference, specifically to capture, you know, the cultural specificity, but as well how um, creativity and art uh, can be um, uh, implemented as well at hospital setting. Uh, that, I think, it's very interesting uh, perspective, how we can complement uh, this area of, uh, you know, um, health knowledge and information uh, with another uh, type of format to present, for example, uh, what are the important uh, health issues or societal uh, challenge we need to address collectively with all the large range of stakeholders. And this, uh, this incubator, it was to really capture, you know, this concept of uh, WHO about health for all. And for example, for WHO, and specifically this quote from Dr. Tedros, it is uh, the access for all to basic health services. Uh, you mentioned that will be my priorities. Uh, why? Because it's indispensable to reach universal coverage to guarantee financial security of patients, but as well to improve quality of care and to sustain this, uh, this quality. Uh, it is to uh, encourage as well uh, all the stakeholders to focus uh, more uh, to uh, create joint efforts to reach uh, together the sustainable development goals. And it is a way we will see to, uh, to achieve and maintain well-being at individual level, but as well uh, at family, community and uh, in including country level. And this incubator, what it is the specificity of that, it is really to reflect about how art speaks for itself. Uh, it is really to an opportunity, specifically at country level, to introduce and value, and value art and culture, uh, specifically in hospital environment uh, and as innovative strategy and to demonstrate uh, how it is impactful and that can contribute to health for all. With this type of 
art perspective, uh, we have the opportunity to integrate art in health, but as well in all, um, in all SDGs policies. Uh, it is a way for us to support our, the art program and initiative at national uh, health, uh, delivered by national health authorities, but as well other players. Uh, and it is as well a strategy to uh, rehumanize uh, health services and really to, to, to implement in practice um, integrated and pe people-centered uh, approach uh, to healthcare services. And finally, it is a way to foster uh, partnership with uh, social and uh, human vision with, uh, with the human and the, at the center. And in terms of concept of, uh, of this incubator, the idea was to, to, to design a strong bridge between art and science and to demonstrate you have not art from one side and science from another side. Uh, you can be as well a scientific and artist like me, but many other people, uh, uh, they are doing that. For example, you have a nurse and uh, some nurse are artists, some doctors are artists, some uh, you know, and different type of art. They can be musicians, they can be painters, they can be dancers. Uh, though it's, it's not to separate the two parts of the brain, but uh, in contrary, to integrate the full uh, skills uh, and potential of human beings to deliver uh, uh, better uh, services uh, to, to, the, to the population, to the people. And uh, for that, uh, it's very interesting because for this incubator, we have uh, been able to use uh, an organic design. You can see, for example, from this slide uh, with the neurons effect on, uh, on, on, the, on the left uh, of, of the slide. And here it's really to, to design organic community, communities and uh, and when they have uh, developed well, uh, sometimes they can um, retransform uh, themselves or um, they can as well uh, create other uh, communities. So it's really an uh, interesting design. And we have used as well what we call distributed leadership. And to, to do this incubator, we have uh, been uh, able to, to go in an iterative process with different steps. The first was at specific at country level to initiate uh, the process with a better understanding of the context and the need of the target audience. Specifically, when you have um, uh, some audience can be uh, young, uh, young children, young population, and how they are affected, for example, uh, I will. Uh, tell you more about the, the case of uh, cleft, uh, you know, issues they, they face and how we support them, but it, it is applicable for all uh, those other type of um, health issue, like, um, you know, mental issue, uh, but as well um, uh, any uh, chronic disease, you know, are affected uh, the, the people. And it, uh, it is, um, relevant for each uh, age of the population, from the most uh, young people uh, to, the, to the elderly uh, people. And uh, the second step was to, to really reflect about empowerment, what does it mean in practice, and how art uh, expression can really uh, help to, to formulate, in fact, the pathway story uh, of, of the patient, of their family, of the community, and really to engage them from suffering to resilience and hope. That was really the focus. And the other step was to establish linkage uh, between uh, what I have mentioned, patient, family, and communities, but as well with health professionals. And this interconnection sorry, of pathway, for example, is so important because it's to demonstrate to all of these people uh, what they have in common and what it is not in common. Uh, though it is to demonstrate, you know, again, you are not alone, isolate, and you can share your voice and, and your story. And as well, uh, the final step was really to assess the impact, you know, uh, in a very uh, effective way, practical way, specifically with advanced uh, operational research method.
And uh, as I have mentioned, it, uh, with this type of approach, we can consider uh, the life course transformation of each human being, you know, and, uh, and uh, a very um, integrated approach, you know, through the, this life course. And uh, the main impact factor of this method, uh, what we have, um, we have seen on the field, it is uh, the high agility, it is performed because co-creation is really powerful and uh, that demonstrates the constant adaptation, specifically with the consideration of uh, and the importance of each culture at country level. And it is a way for us to, um, to interact, but as well to engage the local artist and to, to have better understanding of really the, the needs, specifically of the most vulnerable uh, population and as well to, to uh, take attention to different perspectives of, of this type of population. Uh, the other uh, important aspect, it is a short cycle of creation because uh, we've won uh, one workshop on the field for, uh, for some several days, we can really make a difference. Uh, it is uh, an easy way uh, to, to bring uh, different disciplines together and specifically from social science to uh, the most, uh, you know, bio um, biomedical science with uh, health professionals. It is a way for us as well to integrate systematically uh, and to promote diversity uh, with these different perspectives, uh, you know, of needs, of life. And it is a way to create uh, almost immediately mutual trust because we have this reciprocity between people and voluntary contribution, for example, of artists, but as well uh, some voluntary from the, um, the hospital or health sector. And uh, finally, it is a way for us to, to foster, to accelerate the social cohesion. Like art is uh, really uh, looking like uh, uh, health determinants uh, in this perspective. And it is uh, as well a way to implement, you know, uh, for us uh, SDG3 at global level. And uh, when you value all art initiative and program, you know, impact, uh, you can really foster uh, this SDG3 and to, um, to see clearly, you know, the interface with other SDG and how each SDG interfere, interconnect with, uh, with each other. And the interconnection between art and science to communicate and present societal challenge and practical solution is extraordinarily uh, powerful. And for that, we have been able to, 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 uh, to deliver many uh, international art exhibits, you know, and to bring so uh, many uh, interesting uh, players together. And uh, we can really focus on the positive aspect as well, on uh, the strength of the human beings, uh, specifically about the, the resilience pathway, you know, how they find again the hope, uh, how they find as well their own, their autonomy, uh, and they are able to maintain, uh, including by themselves, uh, with this type of creativity uh, activities. Uh, their well-being and to sustain this well-being. And that can be uh, applicable at organizational level or individual level. We have been able as well to look uh, and to do global mapping and monitoring of the most relevant art initiative and program and specifically to assess what have been the criteria of success for this long-term uh, development, sustainable development. And uh, for that, we definitely thinking healthcare systems through art is really uh, important to consider. Uh, for example, very important fact, third and uh, half of all visits to doctors are actually non-medical reasons that are broader issue. For example, feeling lonely or socially isolated. Like imagine with the COVID crisis, how this type of consideration is important. Uh, low level mental health problems or other issues in people's life that might well be translating into health issues, but actually uh, at their root cause are not medical. And here you can see this figure uh, based, uh, you know, on um, key um, 
key number uh, from, uh, from US. Uh, all for healthcare institutions have art programs, uh, including visual art display, performance in public space, and beside art activities for patients. Okay, it's huge. And I think it's underestimated and under tap, you know, to support the health systems. 80% of mental and emotional recovery of patients, 41% um, of physical uh, recovery, 80% of programs serve patients directly, it's, it's huge, 58% include the patient's family, 42% are for staff to help them deal with the stress of working in the healthcare environment and reduce nursing staff turnover. But it's huge. Um, it's a huge uh, key uh, number, uh, and we need to really consider as well the importance uh, of, of art to support well-being. And in terms of direct benefits, uh, art programs reduce healthcare costs. Look, health expenditures are expected to reach 20% of the GDP by 2028. And potential cost saving with the use of music to pediatric, for example, CT scan, could take uh, $2.25 billion uh, from the healthcare cost. Imagine how it is huge. Art, arts benefits elder care, individuals who sang in the chorus had an annual saving of 172. Uh, even 73, sorry, dollars per year per participant. Arts benefit youngs in the in Africa. More than 70% of the youngs were involved in one or more art activities per day. It's huge number. Arts benefits to all citizens. 68% of Americans agree that the art improve health and. The healthcare experience and 73% favor government's funding for art in health programs. For example, we have another case we know, for example, Singapore, they assess uh, every year uh, the impact of um, art program on the, on the well being of, of their population. Donc, some countries are really uh, a leader in, in this type of uh, consideration for, to supporting uh, better the, the life of of the people and uh, of the patient. And uh, I will tell you a little bit uh, the, key, um, the key elements we found about the impact of international art exhibit we have performed. It was fantastic to communicate on health issue and challenge, to value and give a voice to vulnerable communities, local partners and artists in the same time. Uh, it was a way for us to establish a bridge between art and science in a very beautiful way and to create a large worldwide community of stakeholders to act together, specifically on sustainable development goals. Here I just show you uh, the different art exhibits that have been performed, one on uh, violence against women, another one about you know, the transformation agenda from WHO and it was uh, um, a beautiful uh, work have been done with our DG, you know, to demonstrate how, for example, inspirational leadership is very important to um, to change our perspective and to, to change the system for uh, better, to deserve better the, the people in, uh, in the world and specifically to be sure uh, well-being will, will increase. We have done as well uh, some exhibits uh, for universal health coverage and this um, event has been performed in New York and we have been able as well to to, to do um, walk the talk with some um, artists uh, from from Art, Art Street. Uh, Brooklyn artists have joined us to, to, to do a live painting in fact in uh, Central Park. It was an incredible um, and powerful process to encourage people to to have, you know, uh, physical activities, of course, regular physical activities, but as well to express themselves. And uh, after we have done as well one on uh, sustainable development goals and uh, one on, uh, on the topic of resilience, uh, it was the name was called Versus, and it was really to give the voice to uh, many um, 
many people, you know, have used art to find their own resilience, you know, including some people affected by mental health, but as well uh, some uh, some organization, you know, and uh, and how they can really make the difference vulnerable population and finally the, the last big art exhibit we have performed it was about you know planetary health and how uh, we need to consider all the different sectors and as well our, uh, the importance uh, of our linkage with nature to preserve nature around of us uh, and it was uh, an exhibit uh, about call about art to be alive and we have performed this exhibit uh, exhibition in uh, Geneva Health Forum and uh, United Nations Palais. And I, I will finish with uh, the impact of, uh, of this type of work at uh, national uh, and, lo and uh, local level uh, through uh, what we call creative workshop and as well art exhibit. Um, what is the advantage? In, with that, we provide socio-psychological support in practice to vulnerable and disabled people and specifically the patients, their parents, and their local communities. The, to, uh, that it is a way to involve and engage local partners and organizations. It is a way to value and give a voice to vulnerable community local partners and artists in the same time, like I have mentioned previously, to demonstrate as well in action sustainable impact and how we act together on, on sustainable development goals in terms of implementation at country level. We have uh, using uh, arts uh, specifically on the prescription services and uh, what we call social prescribing, and it's very efficient. For example, when we include social prescribing specifically at hospital level, we increase self-confidence for the patient, we improve social and communication skills, we increase motivation and inspiration from the both sides, from the patient, but as well for health professionals, you know, and, and, um, and some profession will complement as well the work of the health professionals. Both hard and soft outcomes were identifiable, but most were soft outcomes. Practical and aspirational achievement, broaden an horizon, uh, accessing new world, assuming and sustaining uh, new identities and social and relational perception. So I think it was the key elements of uh, this work. We have uh, done this um, incredible uh, creative workshop in, um, in Peru. It was amazing to, to really engage and uh, connect with all, uh, all these children affected by cleft. And that has been done with, uh, in partnership with uh, Smile Train, our uh, key partner in that. We have done the same type of uh, workshop in Colombia, including with COVID. We have done this workshop at distance, and it was very successful, including if we we were, uh, we were not on the, on the field. And uh, here you can see some quote of, par of participants. I will not read everything, but just for example, uh, to illustrate uh, this quote from the coordinator, happy, grateful, and motivated to seek equal treatment for all, regardless of difference. And that I think speaks for, for itself, you know. Like a very beautiful testimony from, uh, from the children to, to the uh, professionals as well. And uh, we have as well uh, done uh, this workshop recently in Mexico with a beautiful um, association, uh, local association uh, performing art and uh, giving art lessons for children. And we have been able as well to implement um, this uh, initiative in more broad um, approach in Morocco with the health authorities and specifically with the, the head of the CHU of Mohamed VI. Um, well, uh, for, sorry. And that have been, uh, have been done with um, the support of very important uh, program in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, and this program uh, really uh, is able to support uh, this main hospital to create a new reason for cooperation between the health and the cultural sectors. And he, he can support uh, every the development of artistic and cultural spirit for all the CHU staff and for the patient. 
strengthen the cultural communication links with the patient and the diffusion of associative spirit between civil society and patient. And here you can see just an uh, illustration of uh, art activities in different parts of the hospital. Here for the mother and child uh, services, and you can see the activities with the children. Uh, it was really uh, beautiful and we have been able uh, as well to, to do conference, to portray the conference with art, specifically for the diagnostic uh, center. And uh, as well, we have been able to work with the palliative care uh, center uh, in Marrakech uh, and to really uh, engage uh, some, some patients with um, terminal cancer. And, uh, and as well, uh, it was really a big uh, joy to, to give, um, you know, some piece of art uh, to the Palliative Care Center uh, and to, to give some hope uh, to all the, the patients, you know, uh, affected by, uh, by disease. And uh, thank you so much for uh, your attention, you know, and uh, in conclusion. Uh, in art and culture, nothing is incompatible with the mission of care and services. So holistic approach considers both physical and psychological well-being. From a health promotion perspective, it is not it reserved at the very mission of an institution to help patients or its users move towards a, be, bet, a better being. Art and culture are precious and indispensable tools thinking continuity, thinking sustainability. Very interesting, Isabel. I'm sure we will receive a lot of feedbacks and questions about this. And uh, now it's the time uh, to introduce uh, our next speaker. Of course, uh, thinking about uh, accessibility uh, in services of care means very little if we don't uh, include also the point of view of uh, technological innovations and uh, of the companies that are behind it and, and behind its uh, diffusion. So it's my pleasure to host today uh, Dr. Cora Beckers. She is uh, today application specialist for molecular diagnostics at Roche Diagnostic Deutschland. Although uh, I'm, I've been um, uh, emphatically invited to specify that today we are going to listen to her uh, personal view and not uh, anything, uh, any, so any form of speech uh, that would uh, even remotely represent Roche Diagnostics. <laughs> But uh, with her uh, over a decade of experience in biomedical research and her current involvement uh, in, um, in uh, diagnostics on the uh, entrepreneurial industrial uh, side, I'm sure she has gained uh, quite uh, some um, insights during the rush uh, for innovation and introduction of new testings and new methods during the COVID pandemics. So, Cora, it's my pleasure to leave the stage to you and thank you for accepting to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It is an honor. As Marco mentioned, my name is Cora Beckers and I'm an application specialist for molecular diagnostics at Roche. I was asked to give you a customer service point of view concerning what we have learned during COVID-19. Now at this point I have to stress that though I work for Roche, I cannot speak for Roche policy. The molecular customer support team consists of mainly former researchers with a PhD in biomedical sciences and life sciences, as well as electrotechnical engineers. Personally, I'm a medical biologist with a history in immunology, oncology and cardiovascular disease, and I worked for almost 20 years in academia before turning to Roche, where I now work in the customer support for EMEA LATA. The role of the molecular diagnostic customer support is to install and maintain the CEIVD instruments that isolate DNA from patient materials. Make sure that if technical, software or customer uh, errors occur, the instruments are back up and running as soon as possible. In addition, we report incidences to the appropriate authorities 
and we train ourselves, our customers and our colleagues. During the pandemic, we encountered some uh, specific COVID-induced problems for the customer support. When the sample pool increased and no RPD tests were available, laboratories wanted to use their lab-developed uh, tests for the high-throughput systems. Of course, they expect us to help them implement this, both application and IT-wise. These individual solutions were more time-consuming and complex, and they use a relatively large amount of manpower. It would have been easier to centralize information from the beginning and to open up test protocols for general use. Fortunately, Moldia already uh, provides such a customer platform for exactly this type of information sharing. When IFD tests became available, they were scientifically sound, but they lacked software finesse. With that, I mean that they had confusing terminology, leading to confusion and implementation complexity for both the customer and the support. It would have been better to involve customer support in its software development to reduce future errors, confusion, and instrument damage. In addition, regulatory caution when new tests are concerned caused huge increases in reportable incidents, leading to a complete overload of the expert teams, both locally and worldwide, because again, these expert teams have a limited size. We all agree on the need for this system, but how can we further improve it so it remains efficient, especially under these circumstances? And finally, some misleading or unfortunately written public informations lead to the misunderstanding, lead to misunderstanding and confusion at the customer side. This again leads to us needing to explain the issue. We also uh, noted some COVID-related local problems for the customer support. Regional regulations on how to deal with the samples prior to testing caused off-label use of IVD tests, possibly affecting the result interpretation and the instrument damage. Lack of material availability also caused the use of replacement material, which was not suitable for the instruments, leading to instrument damage and huge repair costs. And finally, and more importantly, efficiency of new IVD test implementation and support depends largely on remote connectivity of systems. The users want these remote connections, but the IT departments are increasingly restrictive with allowing access. In many cases, the use, the use of the USB sticks is not possible anymore either. So how do we update system and test software efficiently in the future? And how to get problem reports for rapid and efficient troubleshooting? In other words, how do we improve from here? How do we train personnel to adopt and contextualize innovations? And can companies play a role? During a crisis, there is no time for training. So how does one transfer information effectively? Tests and instrument manuals and initial troubleshooting solutions, including videos, are 24 seven available online. And some instruments even have a troubleshooting guide built in. And this seems to be effective, and is appreciated by the customers, since they no longer need to wait for us to start the troubleshooting. In addition, we managed to set up two additional training systems during COVID. The first is a remote online session with a trainer. This is interactive, but it's more difficult with a large group. The, the advantage, however, is that it can be rapidly rearranged uh, if something changes. The second is a self-training module that is available 24-7 online for all customers. The advantage is that they can learn at their own time and their own pace. It is, however, not convenient for the first response because uh, it takes longer to rearrange or develop. So what is the advantage of recruiting experienced, ac experienced academics to fulfill these support and training roles? Companies might like to hire fresh out of university, but most of these people lack the experience for the difficult conversations. Experienced customers will not call back, let alone trust that their personnel gets properly trained. Experienced academics are eye to eye with the customer and or their manager. This makes both the conversation and the knowledge transfer easier and the acceptance of solutions and proposal increases. They are also trained to train people, 
especially where the difficult concepts are involved. In addition, they are multidisciplinary and can therefore quickly switch from one topic to another. This flexibility increases the response time to the unexpected, which is exactly what you need in situations like these. They are, in addition, trained problem solvers with multidisciplinary networks, and they know how to use it to make things happen, or at least to get the information that they need. Therefore, we are trained to brainstorm about how to make things better together and innovate healthcare for the future. I hope this contribution was helpful to you, and I thank you for your time. Thank you again, Cora. It was uh, really interesting to listen to your point of view and to your lessons learned. And uh, now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the fourth and last speaker of the day. Uh, the Silvio Noce is a senior legal counsel to the regional council uh, of Emilia Romagna. And uh, I consider him somewhat of a hidden gem that uh, we have the pleasure to host, because despite his uh, terrific experience uh, and insight into uh, policy making and uh, security analysis and a lot of other um, uh, dimensions uh, of the background uh, work that is uh, needed uh, to make uh, uh, service design and service innovation possible. Uh, Silvio is a very um, a shy person, sort of, <laughs> despite uh, his uh, uh, impression, as you will see soon. And uh, it's uh, a rarity to, to have him appear in public until uh, today, at least. Uh, and we would like to make this change uh, with our cooperation. So, Silvio, it's uh, my pleasure to leave the stage to you. Thank you for being here today. Ciao, Marco. Thanks for asking for my contribution. Uh, I'll try to say something clever. Uh, I'll tell you that a few days ago, I was walking through the, the streets of uh, Bologna in the district where the regional and the municipal offices uh, are located. And so a few people lined up in front of the pharmacy. The thing did not surprise me, given the period, but uh, as I approached, I noticed that uh, there were men and women over 70 who were waiting uh, the turn, some clearing, playing um, uh, a card game on the phone, some taking selfie, some shooting a video uh, to share on uh, social networks and uh, uh -huh. all with the smartphone, smartphone in the end. Then I, I don't know why, but my son screamed and uh, I woke up. Before explaining uh, why I told you about my dream, I make a couple of uh, considerations. Just as I were an opinion leader even if uh, I don't have the headset microphone. I mean that the adrenaline rush of digitalization in the period of the pandemic did not consider the essentiality of the elements of social inclusion. I mean, we are running and we are not looking at who is behind. Those who cannot run are left behind, but those who do not want to run are also left behind. In Italy, according to the most recent data from the National Statistics Office, the percentage of people who do not use the Internet within three months is 32.1%. Three out of ten have not used the web. It's a disconcerting fact for us who work in the digital field. But mind you, I have no idea how to bridge the gap, nor do I intend to share social political reflection on this point. I need numbers to give, to give plasticity to our reflection. Our policymakers define digital service that will not be enjoyed by an important slice of the population, or rather cannot be enjoyed by an important part of the population. To make myself understood, I'm talking about a proposal that I defined in a recent paper of mine. 
in a period of, of uh, pandemic and now also confirmed in the ordinary, the legislature has introduced an important simplification measure for citizens. The, the medical prescription must no longer be collected from your doctor, but you can receive a reminder of the prescription by mail, SMS, WhatsApp, yes, WhatsApp, or on the electronic health record, and then show it at the pharmacy to, le to collect it. All these methods require the use of a smartphone. So, without giving precise percentages, the data is that the categories of people who suffer most from the digital divide are placed in the age group 65 and over. It's the same age group that characterizes the regular customers of pharmacies. Therefore, the major recipients of simplification do not, do not benefit from simplification because they not use the smartphone or use the smartphone little and badly. Yet, the medical prescri prescriptions are born electronically. Pharmacies access platform where medical prescription fluctuate. Why it's necessary to impose on the citizens the burden of acquiring information if those who must receive the information can already access the information and therefore the medical prescription. It is the perfect example to introduce a reflection. The design of a digital service must start from a broader logic than the purely technological perimeter of the service. We can use the most advanced technologies, but the point is that in the design it's necessary to consider that a substantial part of the recipients of the service cannot use due to poverty or disability or inability to use it. For this reason, where possible, the goal of those who design the digital services must be to limit or exclude, exclude the interaction between men and the digital system. So, uh, returning to the example above, then the solution is that it would be enough to go to the pharmacy with your health card or, or identity document to receive the drugs. The pharmacist can access such data because these data are linked to the citizen's tax code. So the accessibility to digital services must not be limited to making a web platform or software available to people with disabilities. This is necessary but not sufficient. This is necessary but not sufficient. Accessibility must be understood as inclusion as digital services designed on the no one behind paradigm. I'll give you an example. A Finnish administration, I don't say the name because the idea was not mine and I don't advertise for free, has implemented an automatic school enrollment service. Children who finish the elementary school are automatically enrolled in the school of higher grade with notification by SMS to the parents. This made me think about the formal communications, the answer not received, the phone calls we made together with our children's schools. I am convinced that the choices of this kind, which make administrative processes slip like a ball on a well-oiled bowling alley, can also have an impact on a school dropout. It is the perfect example to consider how much the included ways of designing a service have evident effects precisely on the effectiveness of the service itself. In summary, the basic concepts I have expressed with my short speech are very much linked to the words and their meaning. We calibrate our efforts not towards digitalization, no, because it is called, or linked to machines, 
but towards digital transformation because it encompasses the social psychological dimensions and therefore also in, of inclusion and accessibility. Inclusion and accessibility in a moment of great dynamism require enhancing the need to design digital services in such a way that there is the highest possible number of subjects on which the service has a positive impact, but the least possible number of subjects who they must necessarily use it actively. So thanks Marco for the chance you gave me. Bye bye. Thank you again Silvio. As sharp and clear as expected, as usual. It's a pleasure to work with you. Now, after uh, this uh, terrific lineup of speakers, if I may say so myself, it's uh, an humbling experience to try to sum up uh, the conversation and, and, and give uh, a take home message. I, I have uh, thus decided to rather um, comment. Uh, a bit further the issue of accessibility and I will uh, borrow from uh, Professor Mike Martin uh, of the University of Northumbria in the UK this slide uh, and uh, a lot of concepts uh, I dare to consider Mike uh, my senior <laughs> uh, although I'm not sure if I am acknowledged as a student of his um, about uh, some socio-technical reflections around the concept of information and I believe actually around uh, the, the concept of a system itself. In fact, uh, if we all know that uh, more is different, we have to acknowledge that uh, as uh, the components and the nature of these components that interact in, in the delivery of a certain behavior increases, we are not just uh, uh, seeing uh, the emergence of new patterns of, of the same kind, but we are actually seeing switches in quality. And um, these uh, four views, the engineering, communication, conversation, and social cultural views around information, I think capture very well the kind of conversations and uh, considerations of designs that we should uh, all try to bring uh, into the design of new services, especially when thinking about accessibility for all people. We, we have to consider that uh, there are uh, not just uh, technical aspects like bit and terabytes where we can discuss about what is happening where, but not really about its meaning, but there are um, uh, uh, some aspects uh, that are still en encoded within the systems what is captured by the communication view, so codes, the notations, these are predefined meanings, these are triggers that will uh, um, uh, evoke certain actions or certain roles in the systems and, and the great trap is uh, forgetting that the map is not the territory so we, we always need to strive and have a conversation and some form of feedback loop between this layer and the conversational view where um, meaning uh, including the interpretations and responsibilities are emerging and uh, these are not necessarily always adhering to our uh, initial preconceptions. So a, a third step back, the social cultural view, where we negotiate new meanings and new governed practices should be involved as a way to close the loop between uh, the, the various layers, making sure that the technical infrastructure is not deciding what is possible in society, but it's rather at the service of what we want to see emerging in societies and continually striving to evolve to make it possible. 
this in, in, in synthesis I believe is uh, the social contract behind uh, the Charter of Trieste and uh, I invite you all to read it and to send us feedbacks uh, to send us the expressions of interest to sign it uh, at the moment it's uh, available on Zinodo and I know it's available on some pages of the National Institute of Health we will uh, soon uh, prepare a devoted web page where um, a wiki style system will be available and we will be collecting um, uh, ex expressions of interest by signatories. Uh, we will, uh, I think, at least add uh, the link in the description on the server's likely YouTube where this video will be charged. So please uh, follow us and uh, consider joining us. And uh, thank you all for your attention. I hope and I trust this has been a very interesting uh, session to all of you. And uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, we look to hear from you to learn more and to work together towards uh, granting accessibility to everyone. So thank you and uh, talk to you soon. Ciao.